Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the UNCBD Secretariat for inviting me to speak at this important forum. As the international community looks to secure a new global biodiversity framework in Montreal, I'm pleased to see that significant attention is being directed toward finance solutions. Ultimately, the way we value and finance nature, and in particular, the way we incentivize private sector participation will determine the fate of the new global agreement. Back in 2019, the Chinese Minister for Ecology and the Environment understood this, and given China's incoming presidency of the UNCBD process, asked for advice on how to mobilize more finance resources for global biodiversity conservation. That is why the Paulson Institute published a groundbreaking report called Financing Nature, Closing the Global Biodiversity Financing Gap in September of 2020, in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and Cornell University. I'm pleased that the report has informed the negotiations on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Our report examines current global financial flows into biodiversity protection and estimates future flows that are needed to protect and restore our most important biodiversity. I encourage you to read the report, but let me offer some of the most important takeaways. The most important is that it's far cheaper to prevent environmental damage in the first place than to clean it up afterwards. Political leaders want to keep their jobs, so it is difficult for them to adopt policies that require sacrifices and pain in the short term to achieve long-term prosperity, particularly when it means changing long-established economic models and practices supported by entrenched vested interests. Instead, the tendency is to prioritize immediate economic gains. But in the areas where we can make the biggest difference to conserve and protect biodiversity, we don't need to spend a lot of money. It just takes political will. Reforming harmful agricultural subsidies for forestry, fisheries, and farming would cost little or nothing. These perverse subsidies could be changed to still incentivize production while limiting our damage to natural capital. Better infrastructure planning would also make a big impact. Given the trillions of dollars invested in infrastructure, it's important to mainstream biodiversity-related risk management practices and ways that mitigate the damage. A financial investors and lenders should also be required to do more to disclose the positive and negative environmental impact of their financing and lending decisions. Second, the fundamental reason we are losing biodiversity so fast is that our political and economic systems and financial markets do not properly account for the services that nature provides. For hundreds of years, we've treated our natural capital as if it is inexhaustible. This may have been immaterial when the human impact of the planet was small, but this is no longer the case. Today, we are in the middle of what scientists describe as a sixth mass extinction, with an estimated extinction rate of species of a thousand times the natural rate. That presents tremendous risk to humanity. Third, while it's impossible to calculate the global spending on biodiversity precisely, the analysis from our report estimates that annually we are facing a biodiversity financing gap of over $700 billion over the next 10 years. This calculation is imperfect at best, but we can't let the imperfect be the enemy of the good. Because when we don't put an economic value on natural capital, policymakers consider nature's benefits free. And as, a, and as a result, they are valued at zero. At $700 billion a year, the financing gap may sound large, but to put it into perspective, it's less than 1% of global GDP and less than the world spends on soft drinks in a year. Fourth, climate change is accelerating and exacerbating the biodiversity crisis. And in a vicious cycle, biodiversity loss is also contributing to climate change. And although the biodiversity crisis is a long way behind climate change in terms of our scientific understanding and political attention, 
And in many ways, it is even more alarming than climate change. There's much more we don't know about the dangers of throwing a complex system like Mother Nature out of balance. There are no technological fixes to restore species that go extinct and no cost-effective man-made replacement for natural systems such as wetlands, which provide protection against floods, support fisheries, and replenish groundwater reserves. Climate change and biodiversity loss are inextricably linked and must be tackled together in an integrated way. The report is clear. To arrest biodiversity loss and manage the associated risks, we need to do two things. First, we need to finance green. That means mobilizing resources to implement the global biodiversity framework, closing the $700 billion annual biodiversity financing gap. And second, we must green finance. That is aligning public and private financial flows in the $94 trillion global economy to be nature positive, in line with the 2050 vision of the Convention on Biodiversity. The report has helped to put resource mobilization at the heart of the CBD negotiations. In building on the findings, I was delighted to see a group of forward-thinking political leaders at the UN General Assembly in New York recently launch a 10-point plan for biodiversity finance, which sets out a clear way ahead, beginning with a comprehensive deal here at COP15. The Paulson Institute is honored to support this effort and I urge more countries and financial institutions to endorse this plan. This leads me to my final point. The private sector is often, with good reason, touted as a great hope for conservation. After all, the financial resources the private sector can bring to bear dwarf those available to governments. In the CBD negotiations, the focus is often on government funding, which is in the order of billions. Private sector investment is in the order of tens of trillions. Steering the private sector investment is fundamental to the success of this new global agreement. But it is vital to understand that although many companies are piloting innovative ways to invest in nature, the bulk of private sector capital will shift away from environmentally harmful activities and towards those that protect and restore nature only, only if it is profitable. The new global biodiversity framework is a vital step forward that is to be welcomed wholeheartedly. But it will only be successful if there is an urgent conversation between the private sector and national governments about how to create the most efficient incentives and regulatory framework that can steer investment away from activities that harm nature and toward those that support the goals and objectives of the global biodiversity framework while maintaining profitability. I very much hope that this conversation can begin here today and come to an urgent conclusion in 2023. In closing, there is a compelling economic, financial, and business case for protecting nature. However, we should keep in mind that there is an overwhelming case for preserving nature for its own sake. Nature is a great source of beauty, inspiration, innovation, and intellectual interest. Indeed, of everything that is good about life. In that sense, it is priceless. Thank you.